Hey everybody, and Tony here with my review of Strauss's Elektra with conductor Alexander Saudi, which I saw at the Deutsche Oper Berlin. This marks the third time I saw Richard Strauss's Elektra at the Deutsche Oper Berlin because I wanted to see and hear Carita Matila, who was once upon a time very known for her interpretation of Chrysotemis, whether it be at the Met or many other European opera houses sing the role of Kritamnestra. It should be no surprise that I've been following Carita Matela's career for nearly a decade and a half. And I've seen her grow from being a lyric soprano in the 90s to being established in more spinto soprano roles such as Tosca from Puccini's Tosca, as well as dramatic soprano roles such as Leonora from Fidelio, to nowadays taking on more mezzo-soprano roles such as the Kostelnitschka from Janaszek Sienufa, Madame de Quassi from Le Dialogue de Camelite by Poulon, Kabanica from Janaszek's Katia Kabanova, and of course, Kritemnestra from Strauss's Elektra. I continue to enjoy Madame Matela's flair for drama and flair for making Clitemnestra an anxious, nervous, and guilt-ridden queen who is haunted by her dreams, traumatized by the effect that her and a gist murdering Agamemnon has on her, and her overall commitment as a singing actress. And she does have those strong chest notes to show that her voice, while showing signs of wear and tear and age, is still intact. And she was able to naturally sing those chest tones with abandon. And she was also able to be such a thoroughly committed singing actress, thus bringing in a lot of nuance and a lot of interest to the role of Kritomnestra. Perhaps the best asset I always loved about Carita Matela's voice is her middle. There's a sort of richness and mellowness that I enjoy, especially when it came to those years that she sang chiefly as a full lyric soprano slash spinto soprano. And her middle is still intact, thus making her timbre fine all around, although there were occasions where she sounded kind of screamy in certain passages, especially in the more dramatic passages. But it was those chest tones and her gorgeous middle that managed to make her performance of Kritamnestra stirring. Yes, there were occasions where she could have used a lot more chest tones in the moment where she pleads to Elektra that she doesn't want her to be stubborn and that she's just so glad that she was able to listen to her before Elektra inquires of the whereabouts of her brother Orestes. And if there's one piece of advice I would love to give to Madame Matila for future performances of Kritamnestra, it's this. Please really dig into those chest tones because that is where all the magic and all the thrills are, especially when it comes to making Kritamnestra thoroughly realized as a character. And it will also help her voice continue to be in mint condition for many years to come. But even in spite of some issues that I found with Carita Matela's performance as Clitemnestra, she was still so laudable as this guilt-ridden, nervous, and anxious queen. Yes, there is no doubt that I have in my ears and, of course, in my heart, a lot of the great interpreters of Clitemnestra, such as the OG Ernestina Schumann Heinck, Gusta Hama, Elsa Schürhoff, Karin Branzell, Kerstin Torborg, Res Fischer, Elisabeth Höngen, Marta Mödel, Astrid Varnay, and lest I forget about Jean Madeira, Regina Resnick, Irene Dallas, Sonia Charvena, Leonie Rizenek, in the late 80s to the 90s, Krista Ludwig and Maureen 
Forrester. And of course, Reinhild Runkel and Jane Henshaw, all thanks to their fine use of chest voice. Those voices, whether they be contraltos, dramatic mezzos, or dramatic sopranos late in their career, all had wonderful voices that I loved as Kritomnestra. Heck, even Astrid Varnai had way richer chest tones, contralto-like chest tones, and stronger chest tones than Carita Matila could ever accomplish. And I dare not forget about that more dragon-like quality of Varnai's laugh once she finds out that Orest is supposedly dead. Matila's laugh has that sort of nervousness and anxiousness that although she thinks she knows that Orest is dead, there's still that nervousness looming about her, thus making Madame Matila's performance as Clitemnestra, as I mentioned before, nuanced and a lot more multidimensional. And it's something that I will continue to give a lot of credit to. However, with much stronger interpreters of the role, especially in the past, from Astrid Barnai, Marta Mödel, Karim Brancel, Kerstin Torborg, and Gusta Hama, I do feel that Carita Matila's interpretation of Clitemnestra pales in comparison to those sacred monsters. Nevertheless, with what Carita Matila had to work with as Clitemnestra, she was still sufficiently laudable as this queen. I was just as anxious to see and hear Florina Stucki sing the role of Chrysotemis because I initially believed that Miss Stucki had a future in more florid repertoire as well as more bel canto and French repertoire. And I was just surprised to know that for someone who was supposed to sing her first Maria Bocanegra, aka Amelia Grimaldi from Verdi's Simon Bocanegra, she's starting to go the more lyric slash spinto soprano route with an upcoming Elsa from Brabant from Wagner's Lohengrin. So my doubts for Florina Stucki as Chrysotemis were a lot more realized. And after I heard her as Chrysotemis, those doubts did come to full fruition as I thought that her voice was way too lyrical and way too light for this otherwise huge and dramatic role. Don't get me wrong, I do love the commitment that Miss Stucki had in terms of embodying Chrysotemis as this virgin who wants to be away from this dire hellhole that she and her sister Electra have found themselves in. I will give her credit where credit is due in terms of how she was able to lunge at her high notes with abandon, thus making her voice sufficiently heard throughout the theater. And I will also give credit to her being sufficiently brave for tackling this extremely taxing and extremely demanding role. However, the facts cannot be denied that her voice was too light and not really that ideal for Chrysotemis because I always love it when a true spinto, let alone a true dramatic soprano, sings this role. And let's also not forget my personal favorite chrysotemises that I love so much, such as the OG Margarita Zims, Frances Rose, Lucia Veit, Hedy Irashema Brühlmann, Dorothea Mansky, Goethe Ljungberg, Rose Pauli before she became very well known as Elektra, Fioritza Ursuleat, Charlotte Börner, Annelies Kupa, Walburga Wegner, Hedwig Müller Bütel, Gladys Kochta, Francis Yint, and the absolute brilliance that was Leonie Rizenek, who in turn is my most favorite interpreter of Chrysotemis of all time. And that's saying something because I really loved everything about Leonie Rizenek as Chrysotemis, whether they come from her blazing top notes or even the color that I love in her voice and that sufficient metal and steel that she had to sing over an orchestra. She had that. Unfortunately, Florina Stucki's 
lyrical voice was not really that capable of singing over the orchestra. And when she had to sing over that orchestra, she had to really strain for those high notes just to let her voice be heard, which is really sad because about three to four years ago, I heard her voice in a lead concert and her voice was pleasant. It was sweet when she sang those lida. However, as I heard her tonight as Chrysotomus, I was quite scared for her because I was already starting to hear some wobbles and tremolos in her voice, and she is still a young soprano. There is still a semblance of a good voice in there, but she has to be very careful of her repertoire. I would highly suggest that instead of touching roles such as Chrysotomus, and even the more spinto-y roles such as Maria Bocanegra from Simon Bocanegra and even her upcoming Elsa from Brabant from Lohengrin, I would highly suggest that she continues with Christina Storr from Intermezzo, Arabella from Richard Strauss's Arabella, Comtesse Madeleine from Capriccio, Mimi from La Boheme, Liu from Turandot, and of course, the title role of Puccini's Suor Angelica. The lyric soprano repertoire is where Florina Stucchi needs to remain in. If she continues to lead her voice astray with these more demanding roles, then in five years' time, her voice may as well be destroyed. But I am really hoping that Miss Stucchi continues to take good care of her voice and really work on her technique and polish it further because there is a good lyric soprano voice in Florina Stucchi. I just do not want to see and hear it damaged because there's a lot of fine material that she can work with and I do hope that she does not end up abusing her voice because as I stated before, she's got good material. She just needs to make sure that her voice remains in the right direction in the best way possible, as well as continue working on her technique in the right way so that her voice and her singing career can last for many years to come. Catherine Foster may not be my most favorite interpreter of Electra in terms of her vocal prowess, but... I really do enjoy how she was able to sing over that orchestra and use those top notes to her advantage, thus showing brilliance and full abandon with everything she's got. And I also love the way that she was able to portray Electra not as this angry, brooding, and perpetually miserable young woman, but as this avenging angel who knows only one thing in life, and that is violence and death, and also uses some of that sense of humor to try to lighten people up in her own weird and dark way, all while having this aura of a lost and lonely young woman who convinces the people that she trusts to try to do away with Clytemnestra and Aegist, whether it be Chrysotemis and the eventual triumphant return of Orest. And in terms of her stage presence, her interpretation of Electra demonstrates just how much of a lonely yet mischievous young woman she is, whether it be playfully taunting Chrysotemis or even showing her unbridled wrath against her mother Clytemnestra, being sadistically playful with Aegist, or even comforted by Orest. She does all of that and more, and I definitely salute Catherine Foster for what she was able to deliver theatrically as Electra. Vocally speaking, I have been rather on the fence with Catherine Foster as a singer. There is no doubt that I continue to love the commitment that she has as a vocalist, launching top note after top note with everything she's got and everything in her system, and even committing to some nice middle notes and low notes. However, there were occasions where her chest tones 
and her middle notes tended to thin out and disappear, thus making her voice have the tendency to be rather shrill at the top and unsupported at the middle and at the bottom, which is quite a shame because Catherine Foster does have a naturally interesting instrument that she uses quite well and effectively to bring out the nervousness and the girlishness that Electra has and not just make her another angry, angsty, and just totally negative young woman who is so obsessed with death. And although I do miss that strong metallic quality that I love in voices like Gertrude Rünger, Helena Wildbrunn, Astrid Warnay, Annika Netzny, Erna Schluter, Helena Braun, Nadezhda Kniplova, Danica Mastilovic, Gwyneth Jones, as well as the complete packages that Rose Pauli, Gertrude Grobe-Prandl, Birgit Nilsson, Gerda Lamas, Janice Martin, and even Isolde Eichlep had to offer, and to some extent, Deborah Pulaski for the size of her voice. I do miss that chestiness that I totally adore, whether it be from Astrid Varnay's deep tones or even Birgit Nilsson's complete technique, thus making everything that they have done as Elektra totally strong and totally formidable all around. However, when all is said and done, I still have to give Catherine Foster a lot of credit for what she was able to accomplish as Elektra. While her voice may not be my most favorite for this role, what she was able to accomplish as Elektra was commitment as well as her flair for drama and making Elektra a more fully fleshed out character. So I still have to salute Madame Catherine Foster for a job laudably done in terms of her characterization and of course in terms of her commitment as a singing actress. I will say this once and I'll say this again. I am not crazy about any character tenor singing a gist and Burkhard Ulrich fits that bill. But that's not to say that he was a terrible singer, no. In fact, he was a committed singing actor, but it's just not the type of voice I would love in any tenor singing a gist. And if you know me, I prefer it when I hear a powerful and strong Helen tenor singing this otherwise thankless part. And whenever I think of tenors singing a gist, I would automatically consult the likes of Max Lorenz at Svanholm, Ludwig Suthaus, Ramon Vinay, Hans Beurer, Helmut Melchert, although he's not really that much of a Helen tenor, but more of a Spinto tenor, and my personal favorite, totally ranking up there with Hans Beira as also my favorite a guest, James King. These are Helen tenors that I love as a guest because of their complete technique, round tones, blazing top notes, and that overall metallic quality that makes a guest first and foremost, a king. With Burkhard Ulrich, yes, he was a committed singing actor, and I do love the fact that he was able to navigate this otherwise thankless role. However, his vocal resources were insufficient for this role because as he was crying out for help that he was being murdered by both Orest and his tutor, his voice was totally drowned out by the orchestra, which was a huge shame because this was a moment I always anticipate. And whenever you have a tenor with the right voice, the right dramatic voice to make this thankless character come alive, it could be brilliant. But if you have a tenor who cannot sing over an orchestra, that can cause some issues, especially with the role of a guest. Despite my gripes with Burkhard Ulrich as a guest, he was still a fine singing actor, although I would have loved to have a much stronger, fuller, richer, and steelier voice to sing a guest. Because a steely Helen Tenois voice who can hit 
that high note before he ends up being slaughtered is what we definitely need. At least Mr. Uri's commitment as a singing actor cannot be questioned, although his vocal resources were insufficient for this role. But stealing the show tonight, not only from the main male roles, but from everybody's feet, was none other than Tobias Kira as Orest. And my goodness, did he have such a beautiful, round, exciting, and rich basso cantante slash basso profondo voice that I consider myself privileged to have heard grow from strength to strength. From my first experience of listening to him as Zarastro from the Zauberflöte, and with every subsequent performance I have been listening to him, I was completely impressed by how his voice bloomed and grew with time and with effort and with much dedication to the point where I was so excited to see him on stage. I was definitely blown away with that great quality that Mr. Kira had in terms of what he was able to accomplish as Ores. And I also loved how he was able to make Orest start out as this mysterious figure thanks to his dark and cavernous voice, and then this tragic anti-hero as the opera goes on. The only caveat that I had with Tobias Kira as Orest was that he was struggling with the high notes before the tutor intercedes that this journey is going to be quite troublesome. However, I could forgive that misstep because Mr. Kira's vocal qualities were spot on and absolutely awesome, and he definitely stole the show from everybody's feet thanks to his sterling technique. The singing of the minor roles did have some good singers as well as some decent singers at best, but with some reservations here and there. Michael Bartadze, who sang the old servant's only line, had a decently strong stage presence, but his baritone voice was unfortunately ill-fitting as the old servant. Nevertheless, he did use what he had, and the result was quite decent at best, although I really would have loved to have a basso profondo singing the role of the old servant as thankless as this part is. Magnus Piontek was a very good tutor to Orest with his sufficiently plush basso cantante voice, and I would really love to hear his voice grow in richness, in depth, and in darkness, and I would definitely recommend Josef Greindl as his main source of inspiration because, as we know, Josef Greindl had those organ-like deep and low notes that made him so well-known, especially in roles such as Hagen from Götterdämmerung, and even, whether people like him or not, in this particular role, Philip II from Don Carlo. Nevertheless, Magnus Piontek did strike an interesting first impression as the tutor to Orest. However, among the men, Patrick Cook and his strong and beautiful lyric tenor voice was the absolute standout as the young servant. It was sufficiently virile and sufficiently exciting that I would love to hear him in a lot more leading male roles at the Deutsche Oper Berlin. He's got great material and here's also hoping that his future will remain as bright all thanks to that strong, full lyric tenor voice. The contributions made by Elisa Vertiers and Sua Jo's lyric soprano voices as the confidant and the train bearer were sufficient, and although Vertiers did have a bit of a shaky start, she did end up a little bit vocally stronger, but with Sua Jo being the more consistent of the two very, very small parts. So here's hoping that both Elisa Vertier and Sua Jo continue to develop their lyric soprano voices in the the best way possible. Pionuela McCarthy I was not too crazy about as the overseer because I thought she was underpowered and too lyrical and too light for this otherwise demanding and ungrateful role, but she did have a sufficiently fine stage presence, although I do miss that plushness that I love in contraltos such 
as Ina Gerhein, Cornelia Wolkopf, and Elsa Schurhoff, as well as that exciting and piercing quality that I love in mezzo-sopranos singing the overseer, such as Mariana Lipovschek, Margarita Hintermeyer, Waltraud Winsauer, and my personal favorites, Carol Wyatt and Margaret Rogero. But other than those gripes that I had with Fionuala McCarthy's voice being too light for the overseer, I thought she was able to make the best out of this otherwise extremely thankless role. Annika Schlich's first maid was sufficiently chesty and absolutely gorgeously sung, although she does need to continue to develop those rich chest tones if she is to keep on singing for many years to come. Karis Tucker's gorgeous mezzo-soprano voice was also put to great use as the second maid. Jana Kurutsova was also able to use her chest tones well as the third maid, although I do think that the likes of Rohangis Yachmi and Ursula Böse are my personal favorite choices for the third maid. Alexander Hutton's lyric soprano voice did serve the fourth maid well, although I do love a more spinto soprano voice to sing this role, such as my personal favorite interpreter of the fourth maid, Judith Helwig, and Valeria Savinskaya's absolutely heart-wrenching stage presence as the fifth maid and her equally fine light lyric soprano voice were able to make this character come to life and even when she didn't sing and ended up presumably dying on stage, her interpretation of the fifth maid was completely heart-wrenching and it made me want to root for her. Although the memories that I have with my personal favorite interpreters of the fifth maid would never be diminished, such as the voices of Gerda Scheira and Lotte Rizenek. Nevertheless, Valeria Savinskaya's efforts as the fifth maid can never, ever be taken for granted because she does have a fine, light lyric soprano voice that I would love to see and hear grow to full fruition. So overall, the singing varied in terms of the qualities of each singer. While I definitely loved the commitment that Carita Matila had as a singing actress as Clitumnestra, and I thought that she was able to make the best out of this queen with everything that she had as a singing actress, especially with her chest tones and luscious middle. The memories that I had in terms of the contraltos and the mezzo-sopranos that I love as Clitumnestra can never be overlooked unless I forget about my personal favorite interpreter of Clitumnestra, who was a former Electra, Astrid Varnay. Among all the singers tonight, it was Tobias Kira as Orest who stole the show with his unparalleled vocal prowess that made this character absolutely exciting to listen to. And I dare not forget about Catherine Foster singing up a storm as Electra, although as I said before, her voice is not my most favorite for the role, but I still love her commitment to the craft that she has been polishing for many years. Florina Stucki, I do have some concern for her because she started to develop a wobble, but here's also hoping that she continues to be very wise and conscientious with her choice of repertoire. And although I was not a fan of Burkhard Ulrich as a gist, I still have to give him credit for his commitment as a singing actor. And out of all the small roles, it was Patrick Cook, who sang up a storm as the young servant. And he definitely carried the evening well in terms of the smaller roles. And lest I forget about Annika Schlicht, Karis Tucker, and Jana Kurutsova, who were also the best singers out of all the five maids. They were able to do solid jobs all throughout, and despite some issues I had with some of the singers, I still have to give a great number of them a lot of kudos for their commitment to their craft, and at least for keeping the audience entertained from beginning to end. And the conducting done by Alexander Saudi was well paced in some areas, but there were times that I thought that some areas were a bit too quick, 
or came in a bit too early, and he does need to be a lot more accurate with his timing. Nevertheless, he did make sure that the brass section was working well, especially in the more charged up scenes, and that everybody in the orchestra was working together, and lest they forget about the dancers as Electra's Furies, who were able to make great use of their roles. So with a solidly strong vocal performance by Carita Matela as Clitemnestra and Tobias Kira basically stealing the show from everybody's feet, this evening was quite an interesting one in terms of Richard Strauss's Elektra at the Deutsche Oper Berlin. And aside from Carita Matela's solidly strong Clitemnestra, I still have to give credit to Catherine Foster's equally strong performance as Elektra. And of course, here's hoping that Florina Stucki remains wise and conscientious as well as cognizant with her choice of roles because although I was not a fan of her performance as Chrysotemis, I do believe that there is that chance for her to continue singing in the more lyrical repertoire, which I believe is where her voice should be. And I still have to give loads of kudos to the singers of the small roles, including Patrick Cook, Anika Schlicht, Karis Tucker, and Jana Kurzova, whose techniques were absolutely fine all around. And here's also hoping that they continue to strengthen their said technique. And for those of you who caught Richard Strauss's Elektra at the Deutsche Oper Berlin, what'd you think of it? Did you really enjoy Carita Matela as Kretamnestra? Was there a singer who stole her thunder, such as Tobias Kira as Orest? Or did you feel like the singing was not really to your liking? Please comment below and let me know. Well, that's it for my review of Strauss's Elektra starring Carita Matela as Kretamnestra. Tune in next time for my review of Strauss's Salome also at the Deutsche Oper Berlin, starring Jordan Shanahan as Johanna Ann. So until then, good night everybody!